Right. Uh, first thing, Rabbi Meir thought teacher. Okay. For a first lemma for Shiva Simcha Bat Yeta and Al Cholim of Klal Yisrael. Amen. And for protection of Israel's security and armed forces for their swift victory. Amen. Amen. Okay. Back around to the 39 Malochas. We're starting a new chapter here. Okay. Um, it says in Shmos, chapter 20, verse 10, you shall not perform any creative activity. The word Malacha doesn't literally mean work rather creative activity. The actual Hebrew word for work is avodah. The Torah gives two reasons for, for, for refraining from malacha. One, to commemorate the creation, just as Hashem sees creative activity on the seventh day, so do His people. We thereby demonstrate our faith and acceptance that God alone is the creator. Two, to commemorate the exodus from Egypt. Hashem released us from serving others in order that we may serve Him. Okay, the next part of this. By being required to abstain from work, we can recall His kindness in delivering us from slavery. If a person suffers any doubts about the creation of the world, miracles of the Exodus serve to confirm Hashem's role as the Creator. This is because the miracles were witnessed by a multitude of people and were recorded as undisputed history. Okay, so that's it. So it's not work as people think. Uh, even though work, some elements of work, when you're writing is, is a malocha and tearing things or making firm, it's, it's creative activity, but which will be discussed further, which is, which was in, was in, involved in the creation of the, in, of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle. That's why the 39 Acts or actions are not, are not supposed to be replicated by us on Shabbos. Good. Good, right. good. Um, you guys want to say anything? No, no, we're happy with the room. He was spot on. All right, good, good. All right. Uh, Kev, let's, uh, let's get started. Thank you for teaching us. Uh, I much appreciate it um, because we learn. I've actually learned a lot from you teaching us every time. Believe me, I learn things every session. It's really, really been very helpful. Right. And right. I mean, I'm not super strong on halacha, to be honest. It's not. It's not my uh, big, uh, biggest strength. And I just want to thank you for helping uh, with that. Much appreciated. No worries. Yeah, that makes two of us. Okay, so what um, what I was going to say to you is that let's try and finish the session this time and see see what we can do. I'll tell you where we ended off. Um, we discussed what is this, and it's just something I want to go through with you guys a sec. What what was this thing that uh, I was dis discussing with um, about parallel? I just wanted to make it clear because Gavin actually brought up a good point. He didn't know what we were talking about parallels. And what we're actually talking about is that when you have generally a refutation uh, that cat will be forever blazoned in my psyche when I go through <laughs> um, I'm going to move it up higher so we're not going to be in the way. Okay. I've got to something. I don't know. I'm going to find a place to put this on the balance on top of something. Uh, I'm not even sure. There. That's the best I can do. No, that's lovely, mate. There's no issue. Uh, no issue at all. Can you hear us at least, mate? I don't mind if you're cooking. Can you hear us? He's got a Bluetooth. I'm sure he can okay. hear you. He can. That's fine. Yeah, the Bluetooth gets me anywhere up uh, from here to my office, back in the lounge, wherever I am in the house. I hear you. No talk. issue. All right. So this is what we're talking about. Generally what happens is you'll have a Mishnah and that Mishnah gives you the bottom line of the entire scenario of the case. It's just the bottom line. It's the minutes uh, of the meeting. And then what happens is you have certain issues that come with it up in with the inner Mishnah where there are bones of contention and different opinions between the rabbis. And what happens is there could be a myriad of issues and then you have Bryce's brought, which is outside the formulaic construction of 
the Mishnahs and the Gemurahs that followed, but they carry heavy, heavy weight because they're opinions that just, I don't think were put into writing in a, in a, in a formal manner, but they were carried on from uh, Moshe and Hasina, so they are very strong. Why are we looking for a parallel in this particular case is that the whole uh, Mishnah has to basically be in line with the questioning of Rav Chia Bar Abba that what would Sumchus do in this particular case? And if we find that there's an inconsistency from the beginning of the Mishnah to the end of the Mishnah, then obviously that application becomes null and void. And when we're talking about parallels of Rav Papa, he has got to explain his point of view just as well as Rav Chia Bar Abba, even if they've got different points of view. If you pick up a flaw uh, where it doesn't apply in one part of the Mishnah for either of their cases, then uh, it, it's obviously a problem. And that's all we're talking about when we mention parallels. And I'm making more sense, Gab. Yeah, 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 thank you. All right, let's move on and let's get to a new part. It's exciting. What, what we're talking about here is we're returning to the discussion of Rabbi Barnasan's statement. The text itself stated, Rabbi Barnasan said, if a plaintiff, meaning the one who is suing, claimed wheat from him and the defendant, okay, admitted owing him barley, he is exempt from paying him even barley. So the Gemara asks, what is Rabbi Barnasan teaching us? We have already learned this law in the Mishnah, okay? So what Mishnah did we learn this? There's a Mishnah, there's, there's 17 uh, Schottenstein Gemorahs that are part of the Zikin, and there's something called Shavuos, which are oaths. And in the, uh, in the uh, Duff 38b, it's talking about a particular case where it's talking about, okay, so the Mishnah is discussing a law of Mode B'mitzkast oath. So what is this? It's an oath that applies only when the defendant makes a partial admission regarding the same type of item as which the plaintiff claims. Okay, so here in this case, we're talking about two separate items, Gavin, completely two separate items. So if a plaintiff claimed wheat from him and the defendant admitted owing in barley, he is exempt. So what you did mention the other day, which had a little bit of relevancy, is that this case does come into play not, not only when you've got a dispute of amounts, but you're talking about two different things, apples and oranges. So that does come into play. The reason why we never brought it up as an issue before is it was an issue, it was not an issue at that stage of the Gomorrah. The Gomorrah was talking about a case of Tamam Moad or a big ox or a small ox, and was saying there it was primarily a case of an issue of payment. I don't want to pay full payment. I'm saying my tam ox attached to you. You want full payment, but you need to then bring proof. So there we're talking about payment, and it doesn't matter if it's a difference between a, a big ox or a small or a tam or a muad or a vechugora. You're talking about liability. But here in the classic case, the Gemara is asking, well, what exactly is the issue? And if we go to uh, Shavuas, and Duff, uh, in that particular Duff, in 38b, we're saying the problem that comes is not when they're only disputing the amounts of money, but here primarily they're not even talking about the same item. And we're wondering, as Gavin asked, is this maybe, uh, is this maybe has to do with this particular case? Meaning Gavin was saying our particular case he did pick up a problem, Gavin. What did he say? Our particular case is talking about oxen and oxen. So how can it be compared? Because they're the one guy's talking about wheat. And um, the plaintiff is talking about wheat. You owe me wheat. And the defendant is saying, no, I owe you barley. So Gavin, you did have a point that, that I think I wanted to raise. But it wasn't um, anything but a distraction at the point at which we were dealing it because we were dealing with how much liability is claimed. Does that make sense? So to address your point, there's a particular oath that you take. And that oath is called Mordé Bamekatsas, which means it teaches that you can only take an oath when you make a partial admission regarding the same type of item at, at which the plaintiff claims. So for example, the plaintiff, the one suing, claims that the defendant owes him 
100 sale of wheat. And the defendant responds that he owes only 50 sale of wheat. Okay. However, should the defendant admit to a different type of item, such as in the case of wheat and barley, the plaintiff played the 100% or 100 sale of wheat, and the defendant admitted only 50 sale of barley. The, the Mordé uh, Bimi cuts or doesn't apply because an admission to a different type of item is not considered an admission to the plaintiff's claim. Because when you're doing an oath, you have to use Hashem's name. So we don't want to use Hashem's name in vain. So if they're talking about two different items, there's no oath that's taken. You only have an oath when the amount is disputed, but not when you're talking about an entirely different claim the defendant is admitting to. Is that clear, Kevin? That's fairly straightforward. Nothing confusing. It's like, it's like, it's like using an example and saying, uh, 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 your ox hit my, my, cat, my, my horse or something. Yes, exactly. other one says, no, it, it, but it was an ox that it hit, it didn't hit a horse. That type of thing, I'm just giving an example. Uh, yeah, it, it's pretty much like that. It's pretty much like that. So it's true that Rabbi Barnasan is not saying what the Mishnah says. Because the Mishnah, uh, the Mishnah's language, he uses like the Mishnah's language, right? but in a different case. Rabbi Barnasan means that a plaintiff who makes the claim contrary to what is admitted to by the defendant has in effect forfeited his right to what is admitted by the defendant. So in other words, what it's saying is, um, Gavin, if you say, I owe you 100 sale of wheat, and I say, look, I do owe Gavin something, but I owe him 50 sale of barley, then Gavin says, I'm not prepared to accept that. We're not talking about barley here, and we're not talking about 50 sale. What you've done is you forfeited your right because you're not interested in getting a tenth of the value of what it's worth. Remember, wheat might be worth five times as much as barley because you give barley and oats to horses. And here, we're talking double the amount of meat. So the minute you, in fact, are not even uh, prepared uh, to take a loss in money, you have forfeited your claim to the paltry amount as a defendant that I'm offering to give you. Does that make sense? That's exactly the issue at hand. But the Gemara asked that there wasn't even a need for Rabbi Barnasan to issue his ruling since it emerges naturally from the Mishnah. So that's what we can't understand at this point, is that why are we even bringing up this case of Rabbi Barnasa as being unique, when in fact they could have just quoted the Mishnah um, in Shavuos 38b? Does that make sense, guys? They're saying, what's so unique about Rabbi Barnasa and Satan? And what we've learned uh, is basically, how do I put this in a simple way? The Mishnah states that the admission of Bali is not to be considered as an admission to the plaintiff's claim of wheat. So the admission doesn't create an obligation of an oath. Okay. But in Rabbi Barnasan's case, the defendant's admission of Bali wouldn't obligate him to pay for it. For the defendant's admission in court obligates him only when it confirms the claim made by the plaintiff. So if the defendant admitted Bali, it's deemed unconnected to the plaintiff's claim of wheat. Then the defendant's admission would not even obligate him to pay. This is according to the Nimukha Yosef. Kevin, just repeat to me what I'm saying so I know you're on the same page. Um, I can't say it exactly. Um, Anything, just... Uh, I say something. Okay, so if some... Okay, there's, there's a... Two, um, if someone tries to hold out for exactly what they, 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 what they think they owed, and someone offers them slightly less, they should accept what's offered less instead of getting nothing. But the point is, barley, if, if someone offers barley or produce that has a different value to the actual value that they, to the amount that they, that they, that they think is due to them, that's a problem. That uh, could seem unfair, because barley and wheat have different values. Okay, that's um, good. Um, that's good. Everything you've said is valid. We just have to say one other thing. The, does Gavin want to add anything to that? That's true. So, no, no, so valid. I'm over time, but I think I can get this. So, 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 bottom line is, it's, it's, you can't 
you can't have oranges and apples together. It just doesn't work. So if, if the one guy's claim is apples and the other guy is offering oranges, you see the other oranges, it's, just, it's not going to happen. They're completely different product, uh, what's it? products, completely different products. And it means the whole case is nonsensical as well, because the one guy is saying, you owe me uh, wheat, and the other guy says, I only owe you barley. It just, it means there's something wrong there, intrinsically anyway, as well. Yeah. That's it. So we're adding just two more points, Gavin's correct or so. What we're saying is as follows. So basically, in Rabbi Barnassan's case, the defendant's admission of barley wouldn't obligate him to pay for it. Why? Because all we're learning in the Mishnah is that um, the defendant is not obligated to take a more but me cuts out because they're not the apples and oranges. You can only make an oath when they're talking about apples and apples, exactly as Gavin said. But what we're learn, learning is even more than that, is that never mind the fact that the defendant doesn't have to take an oath, he doesn't even have to pay. Because in this particular case, it's unconnected. Gavin says, I owe him 100 sales of wheat. I say, you know what, Gavin, you're right, I owe you something, 50 sales of barley. So now, what's the court going to do? They can't make me make an oath with Hashem's name in vain. Why? Because it's unrelated to the claim. And remember, Gavin is suing me for wheat. 100 say of wheat. We might, we might be arguing in terms of the amount, and that's a real case. But not if I, Gavin said to me, listen, I lent you two horses. And I said, Gavin, you're right, you lend me something. You lend me a chicken. Lend me a chicken. I lent you two horses. I gave you two horses. You were going to... Yeah, no, Gavin, I've got money for the chicken I bought from you. There's nothing to connect. What do you mean oath? There's not, a, not only is there not an oath, that's what we learned from the Mishnah. But what Rabbi Barnasan is coming to teach us is the case is thrown out of court because now the plaintiff has to bring evidence as to the fact that I bought the two horses, their witnesses saying I'm prepared to pay you for the horses or something. It doesn't, not only am I not going to take an oath, which I'm not going to use Hashem's name in vain, but the case is thrown out of court and I do not have to pay because as the defendant, I'm not admitting to Gavin's claim. Now, you, can't, you can say, but I as the defendant might be lying. So then Gavin has to bring evidence. So what Rabbi Ban Nassan is adding to the Mishnah, we know from the Mishnah you don't take an oath on apples versus oranges. What he's saying here is that we learn now that you don't even have to pay something because it's an unconnected case. It's not the item Gavin suing me for. That's why Rabbi Barnasson's rule applies. Let's move on. So you both added some great uh, insight, guys. So that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. All right. So the Gemara answers, if the law had to be derived from the Mishnah there, I would have said that he's exempt from the value of the wheat. What do we mean from the value of the wheat? He's exempt from any and all obligations stemming from the plaintiff claims of wheat. In other words, he's exempt from the mortar uh, but me cuts out. But um, he is, is, but that, um, so, but there's a problem here. What, what do you think the problem is? Why should you, so in other words, um, I, I'm, guys, I'm trying to put it in a simple way. I would say that obviously now I'm exonerated for the case of wheat. But why is it that I'm not obligated to pay for barley? Does that make sense? In other words, the Gomorrah is saying if the law had to be derived from the Mishnah there, I would have said that he's exempt from the value of wheat, but he is liable for the value of barley. Does that make sense, guys? In other words, the Gomorrah claims that the premise of the question is by no means proven. It might be an omission of barley is deemed to be a separate from the claim of wheat in regarding to the law of Modeh Bami Katsar. In other words, they're saying, why can't I make an oath in terms of owing the barley and how much barley do I owe? But it's still a sufficient response to the plaintiff's claim that constitutes an admission to the claim in court and obligate the defendant to pay for it. So the Gemara is basically saying, well, why aren't I obligated to take an oath then on the barley, or at least pay for the barley? That's the question that's coming up now. 
So, you know, you know what, one of the things that I was thinking of, um, and this probably apply in, in secular law, is that you take, when you're mixing apples and apples, you take the common denominator, which is the money, the monetary value, and you play with that. So the one owes 100, and you take out the fact that it's, I'm just saying in secular, that's how they would look for the common denominator, so you could still get something. Okay. Um, but there is a I don't think problem. It I don't think that quite applies here, but they are kind of saying that the guy shouldn't lose everything. Though. They are kind of saying that in the state, though. Okay, but what we're saying is you can't do that because what you're talking about is a different case where there are a lot of factors on the table. And that's just another factor of a claim amongst many. Because it can't be, Gavin, even in secular law, and I'm asking you, I'm not telling you, I'm asking you a question. If, if you say that I owe you, uh, if you sue me because I bought a motor car from you and you failed to get the money from me, and I turn around and say, Gavin, yes, I bought a little tricycle from you for my toddler. The court's, the court's not going to know what to do with that. They're not going to say, okay, we'll deduct the money from this and then you, uh, he, he'll pay you for the... If the two cases are completely unrelated. How would that uh, how would that work in secular law? No, I'm not an expert, but they would try and reconcile it in secular. I'm just saying they would be. But in what obviously... in what way would you reconcile this? No, this one's tricky. I, I, I would say that using monetary value, because even though the items are not like with like, but I know that neither can take a oath. That I understand because you're looking at different items. Okay, let's different. take let's take secular law in case anyway. In order for you to sue me you would need some sort of evidence. And all the yes. Gamora is turning around and say is, um, if I admit to a certain amount of payment within the same topic, I would then have, to, we would then discuss, well, what's the, if, if as the defendant, I'm admitting to maybe owing you half the money, and we talk about the same item, then you would at least get half the money in a uh, arbitration and that if you, for your lack of evidence, if you can't extract the rest of the money, you'd have to settle for half. Fair enough. But what we're talking about here is a different case. Not only are we talking about a dispute difference of money, we're also talking about two different items. I understand. So the thing of it is the Gomorrah is saying, well, all right, so we understand that the missionary is teaching one thing, that you don't take an oath with Hashem's name. If, you, if the plaintiff is suing the defendant and you expecting a certain outcome of a certain amount of money with a particular product, like a hundred, say 100,000 rands you're expecting of payment for wheat, okay? And I say, yes, I owe you about 20 grand's worth of barley. What we're saying is here is that you're not interested in taking one fifth of the money for something um, and, and you're not prepared to lose 80% of your money. So therefore, because you're not prepared to entertain that sort of loss, you've given up on the claim of the 20%, especially since the items are not homogenous. The question in the Gomorrah is saying, all right, we understand from the Mishnah why I don't take an oath as a defendant, because you're not suing me for that item. In order to ensure that I have to take an oath with Hashem's name, uh, I have to be talking about the same issue that you're suing me over. That's number one. So it's saying, what did Rabbi Barnasan bring here that we didn't know already? What he's saying is that me admitting to barley, we're learning from Rabbi Barnasan means I don't even have to pay for the barley. And the Gomorrah is saying, why not? Why not? If I'm admitting to barley, can't you sue me then for the barley? Does that make sense? That's the question. And the reason that you can't sue me for the barley, okay, is because uh, your pla the plaintiff's failure to make that claim constitutes a forfeiture on his part, as Rashi said, to get payment. Because uh, you're not talking about barley. There is no case for barley. So whether I've admitted it or not is irrelevant. That's what the Gemara is saying. Yeah, no, no, I've got that. I'm just trying to give a second viewpoint of how that might work around it. That's all. Uh, okay. I, yeah, that's what I was trying to say. Okay. 
So, um, so just to summarize, if the law had been derived from the Mishnah there, I would have said that he is exempt from the value of the wheat, but he is liable for barley. Therefore, Rabbi Banasa informs us that the defendant is exempt completely, not only from taking the oath, but even from paying the barley to which he has admitted. Why? Because the plaintiff is not suing him for barley. The Gemara challenges Rabbi Banasa's ruling. We learned in our Mishnah, if the damaged oxen were two, one large and one small, etc., and the damager were also two, one large and one small, the damaged party says the large ox damaged my large one, your large ox damaged my large one, and your small ox damaged my small one. And the damager says not so. Rather, my ox that is small damaged your large ox, and my large ox uh, damaged your small one. So the burden of proof rests on the one who seeks to exact money from his fellow. Okay, This implies that if the damaged party does not bring proof, he takes as much as the damager says. But why is this so? So what the Gomorrah is saying is that this seems to be a problem because he's saying at the moment that he's almost let go of the lesser payment. Both of them here are adamant, it would seem. And then we've learned that this is in contrary or contradiction to Rabbi Barnasan's ruling, saying that if I'm seeing you for wheat, I've given up on the barley because I'm not interested in the barley. I'm interested in getting the full payment for what we're talking about. So we're saying why in this case, if he can't bring proof, does the um, plaintiff get as much as the defendant admits? Okay. One of the reasons I could think of offhand is that you're dealing with like and like in a similar way, actually. I would think you're dealing with oxen. But let's see what the Gomorrah says. This implies that if the damaged party does not bring proof, it takes as much as the damager says. But why is this so? This is, in effect, a case of wheat and barley. Um, so for in both cases, basically, the defendant admits to something that the plaintiff did not claim. Consequently, the ruling of the Mishnah that the plaintiff receives what the defendant admitted to is a contradiction to Rabbi Barnasan's statement. Okay? So, um, the Gomorrah answers, the Mishnah means that he's eligible to take payment if he brings proof, but in the absence of proof, he has nothing. Okay, so this is a bit of a shock. So it's saying, why make the previous statement? Because we've just said, listen, if he can't bring proof, he has to then settle for what the defendant is admitting to. So we're saying again, it's a contradiction to Rabbi Bar Nassim. So um, then the Gomorrah says, hang on a second. But if he doesn't bring proof, he has nothing. So then the Gomorrah challenges his explanation. It says, but it has been taught otherwise in the following Brysa, which concludes regarding this last case of a Mishnah. This one, the damaged party is paid for the small one, from the large one and the large one uh, from the small one. Okay. So basically the Gomorrah rejected his previous assumption that the burden of proof rests on the one who seeks to exact money from his fellow. And that implies that in the absence of such proof, the damaged party would receive the amount to which the damage admitted. But this statement only means that the damaged party must bring proof in order to collect. But without proof, he receives nothing, okay? So in other words, what we see here is the absence of proof, the damaged party does receive the amount of, uh, by the defendant. So what it's saying, Gavin, is that this new Brysa seems to contradict what we've just learned. Because it's saying, hang on, if the large one, da if the large one damaged the large one and the small one damaged the small one, in the absence of proof, we have to give what the defendant said, meaning that the small one damaged the large one and the large one damaged the small, because that's what the defendant admitted to. So we're saying, hang on a second, we seen two different contradictions. So how can this be? So we need to resolve. So can, I, can I just take a step? This is one thing I picked up. Yeah. I can't give you the rabbis exactly, but just tell me if I'm on the right track. What I picked up is that um, uh, the plaintiff in this particular case, if, if, he's, at, if he's certain, if, if he's certain and the other one's certain, then he cannot, then he gets nothing if he has no proof. If he's, if, if, if the, if the, if the plaintiff is 
is probable, not certain, it's probable, then in that particular case, he's entitled to get the lesser amount if he can't prove the, the major amount. Perfect. That's exactly it. But now we're saying we're hitting a problem because now once we've dealt with that, we're saying in this particular case, it's very peculiar because it seems that the plaintiff is certain. And since he's certain, then why does he still have a, a claim to what the damage uh, to what the damager admitted since he wasn't interested in receiving lesser payment for what the damager admitted? He actually, he actually let go of that claim because he said it's nonsense. You owe me the full payment. You don't owe me half. And since he said it's nonsense and he was adamant and he let go of the lesser claim, he can't, when he loses the case, uh, now say, look, I'll take what the um, defendant said and he damaged, uh, he did damage my ox for less, so I'll take less. Exactly as Gavin said. So what we're saying here is when both parties are certain, at the end of the day, he, he doesn't come away with what the damage you admitted to. He comes away with nothing until he brings proof. And what it's saying is, but that contradicts this Bryce that we learned in, in fact, saying that, uh, and in fact, if he doesn't bring proof, he takes as much as the damager says. Uh, because the Bryce has said this one, the damaged party is paid for the small one from the large one and for the large one by the small one. So we're saying there seems to be a contradiction. The Kimura answers that this refers to where the damaged party had already seized the oxen in question in anticipation of his claim in court. But where he did not seize them, the damaged party would receive nothing as rubber by Nassan rules. So what we're saying is Gavin is 100% correct in understanding the, uh, the mission and the point of Rav Papa. If the uh, plaintiff is conciliatory and say, look, it's more likely you're more damaged than the TUM because of its track record, but I'm not letting go of the TUM payment, uh, then in the absence of bringing proof, he gets what the damager admitted to. If he's adamant, he gets nothing. And then this Bryce that deals with the fact that he gets what the uh, damager admitted to is only in the case where he already sees the item. Meaning we learned that possession is nine tenths of the law. If Kevin was a creditor and Gavin was a creditor and Gavin came before Kevin, but Kevin seized, uh, Kevin, are you awake? Mm -hmm. Kevin seized, even though Gavin came, say I lent money from Gavin first. Okay, and then I lent money from Kevin. But Kevin seized the collateral first, even though he was the second to lend me money. Kevin gets to keep it, even though Gavin preceded him in loaning me the money, because possession is nine tenths of the law. So what we're saying is here is he can, if he sees the, if he sees what the damager, um, if he sees what the damager uh, owed him, in other words, the two oxen, then he can't keep the higher claim that he's expecting in the failure of bringing evidence. But he can relinquish uh, to the degree of what the damager admitted. So just bear in mind, he cannot keep the maximum unless he can bring evidence. But if he seized it already, the court can only say, look, the damager did admit to it. So to what the damager admitted, you can keep. That's what it's coming to. Okay. Well, if you see that you you think uh, I did see that I forgot about that, but uh, if if you if you've already seen that, it means that the uh, uh, that not the damaged you yeah, the damaged party, not the damaged party the the other party the damager yeah the defendant damager sorry the damage sorry I'm, I'm exhausted that no, so no, the no. damager then should have stopped him from seizing it you know if if, if he allowed him to see unless he sees it obviously at night when he wasn't watching. But in theory, it's kind of giving him consent by the fact that he no, allowed him to see no, it. No, no, no. But, but at all. Yeah, yeah. Hold on one second. Even okay. if it was done at night, he should have gone back and seized it from him. He didn't do that, which means that he's allowing him to keep it that, in a way. That's what I'm trying to say. All right, Kev, can, uh, you've got a point, but let me give you a scenario. Say the court, is, uh, court date is uh, five months' time, okay? And I said, listen, I'm not happy. And you say, well, bring proof. I'll see you in court in five months' time. Now, you've forgotten about it, right? Then it, you have to go down because, not you, God forbid, 
Reuben has to go down to his father's funeral down in Cape Town. And they, they in the Free State. These two uh, families live next door to each other in the Free State. So Reuven has to go down to Cape Town to his father's funeral. Reuven would not allow Shimon in his property, but basically on the opportunity that Reuven went down to his father's funeral in Oatswin or Cape Town, uh, Shimon decided to, with two or three of his guys, um, uh, take the animal. So there's, that's in no way Reuven's fault. That's in no way Reuven's fault. He never consented. And then, and then it works out that Shimon has got high walls at which Reuben can't have access to get his thing back. So he has to wait now for the court date. Okay, that was a good example. Pretty simple, wasn't it? <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> that a high wall, you, you got me there.